Good morning, everybody. My name is Peter. I'm an alcoholic. <coughs> grateful to be alive and sober and at a meeting. Uh, grateful for this gift of sobriety. Um, what a weekend. Um, what a weekend. I am beside myself. Um, first things first, if I can thank the committee <coughs> for this really wonderful honor and invitation to me to be here with you this weekend. Um, my big book tells me that great events will come to pass for me and countless others. If my relationship with God is right, and this is nothing short of a great event, this has been absolutely wonderful. And what a treat to just be a part of this. Uh, forget about speaking, just to be a part of this. And uh, made lots of uh, new friends and have some friends from New York who are here for support. And to my friends from New York, make yourself at home, hit somebody. <laughs> I got a whole hour, by the way. <laughs> I am very grateful to be a recovered member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I say recovered because that's what my big book promised me, and that's what I've come to experience. I will not share anything this morning on something I do not have experience on, because then I'd be a liar. <clears throat> but God has given me, and you have given me, wonderful experiences which have transformed my life a day at a time. I live a day at a time, but my spirit doesn't wear a watch. My spirit is able to just be and is. And when I'm integrated with that spirit, I don't live in before and I don't live in later on. I am awake to the present moment. What a gift that is. Because my life before I got here was driven by fear. God separated me from alcohol June 23rd, 1988. And I'm very grateful for that. And so are a lot of other people I know. <laughs> But as a recovered member, I automatically assume here a responsibility to uphold the traditions as well as the tradition of Alcoholics Anonymous, to study our literature, to understand our literature, to be in touch with our history. Because I found out, found out here being brought up in Alcoholics Anonymous that when I understand what it is I belong to, I become a better member. And my job is not to suit up and show up now, but to understand where we came from, our very humble beginnings. I mean, this thing started a few years ago, but there's a whole legacy that preceded Alcoholics Anonymous that brought us to this conference, that brought me here to Alcoholics Anonymous. I need to be in touch with that. I need to know about that stuff. So many times I go into meetings and a new AA person walks in and they think AA like I did started when I got here. <laughs> and isn't it a shame that some of us who have been around here a while don't take time out to share our history with them? We didn't have to be there that many years ago. A lot of us were born way after Bill passed away. But shouldn't we be in touch with our history and pass that on to the newcomers who walk in the door so they can be productive members, awake and informed members of Alcoholics Anonymous? That's the way I was brought up in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's what I'm very grateful to be able to do a day at a time. As a recovered member, I no longer suffer from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Because of the information in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, which has awakened my spirit, I'm here today free. Free from the illness, free from a lot of the Ill isms that I suffered from, that drove me. Page 62 says, we're driven by a hundred forms of fear. It drove me up until the day I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and six months separated from alcohol in here, not drinking and going to meetings. It was still driving me because I was still running around in Alcoholics Anonymous untreated. And then a very great man was put in my life by a loving God and I began the journey to the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. My life has never been the same. I just went through this work recently with a new sponsor I met about 18 months ago. God put a wonderful teacher in my life again. You know, let me, let me say this before we get going. If you're s someone new, so I heard, I was at the, the count last night, and there were a bunch of new people floating around, and you don't have a sponsor, and you don't know who to ask, I can tell you from my own experience, this is what you do. You go into prayer and ask God to give you a teacher, because why would he deny someone to take you to him? He won't. So that's what I did. And 18 months ago, a new teacher showed up in my life. And I went through this work again. i had been through this work a couple of times. And my question was, how do I approach this work going through it again? I had a whole lot of information. I had been through the steps. I can tell you the big book forwards and backwards. I've studied it. I've worked with it. I've gone to big book workshops. I've done big book workshops. How do I do this? How do I approach this work again? You know, we're around here a little while and we got this thing called reemergence of ego. I know the book. I could hear someone give a talk and I'm saying, okay, they're talking about page 68. Have I become attached to the information? Have I started to worship the information? Or was I going through this work to get more information or to get a deeper relationship with this power that I ought to be worshiping and seeking? 
And that's what I approach this, this work with this time. Seeking this power rather than be worshiping the information. Because this work in a big book, all the steps that we do, all the things that we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, all these wonderful things, are pointers. They guide us. They take us to a God of our understanding. Where hopefully we get to a place where it's completely stripped of everything, integrated with this power, and we get free. But on the way, what happens is this. The things that take us to a power become the very things that block us from this power. <clears throat> and ego loves it. Because ego will endorse, I heard a gentleman say yesterday, ego will endorse what we know we're doing well. It knows where to get us. My big book tells us this is sly, clever, and devious, difficult to detect. A subtle foe. Alcoholism knows how to work. I went to the University of 86th Street. I had to look up the word subtle. I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> and I found that it was sly, clever, devious, and difficult to detect. A great word for this illness that wants to lay in wait for me, just to be open, to get in, and take me right out of here. So I approach this work by looking to, to, to get a deeper relationship with this power. Many times we get stuck on the second half of the first step. My life's unmanageable, okay. I know that. Blind man can see that. I know I have no power, choice, and control over the first drink, while drinking and while I'm sober. Know that. But then we get it around here a little while, and we start to get okay. You can tell new people right away. The guys get new sneakers and the women get hairdos and manicures. You know they're new right away. Seems to be the first change. I'm not lying. <clears throat> and we get around here a little while, right? And we get a sponsor and we go through the work and we start speaking at lots of meetings and people start to know us. We know where the coffee room is. We know where the restroom is. We know who's chairing the meeting. Things, we go back to work. The wife lets you back in the bedroom, you know. Things start to get nice. We get some money in our pocket. We get a little bit responsible. Things get nice. Things get comfortable. And we become a prey to the comfortability because any lens that we walked in here with, I'll do anything, sponsor, that you tell me to do. Suddenly, it isn't so important. It's like the amends I have to make. Tomorrow I'll do it. I'll throw this out for some consideration. A very great teacher told me this. We say, you know, I've gone through the steps, I've gone through the work, whatever terminology you want to use, it doesn't make a difference to me. But I've gone through the work, I've, you know, I've entered the world of the Spirit. Well, here's the question to consider. Do I have any outstanding amends right now, this morning, Sunday morning, that I'm consciously aware of that I haven't made? Because maybe I've had a spiritual awakening as a result of steps nine and a half. And have I really gone through the steps? Have I really entered the world of the Spirit? Have I really been woken up? And how come I'm not making those amends? Is it possible I have first step reservations that maybe I became the power? That any lens I walked in here with is something like, well, you know what? Um, they don't know me. I don't know them. They don't even remember me. I feel good today. How dangerous. I feel good. Because what we do is we worship our emotions too. See, if I feel good, I wake up on a Monday morning, I feel really good, I feel physically fit, everything's good, there's no noise in my head. I feel good, I feel spiritual, I must be doing something right. Two's I wake up, I don't feel so good. And I start to get down on myself and the judge starts to scream at me. I don't feel so good today. I don't feel so spiritual. So maybe I'm doing something wrong. And I suddenly moved into worshipping my emotions rather than the power. Which is what this is all about. This whole thing is about the glory of God and getting to your God, being integrated with it and passing on to a new person who walks in the door who's completely empty. That's my job. I'm here 15 years, thank the good Lord, recovered. I'm no longer the most important person at any meeting. And if you think you are, maybe you're missing something. Because my job is to serve Alcoholics Anonymous to get the new recruit here, or when they're here, to work with them and pass this on if they want it. And I've been guilty over the years of ramming this down someone's throat, because I wanted it more than you did. And I've been guilty of watering it down, because I wanted it more than you did. Through trial and error, God has moved you to a place. If you want it, I'll walk through fire with you, but you're going with me. And we'll get to the other side of that archway, one way or the other. And we'll both stand free, and then you'll go back into the fellowship and pull somebody out like me who wants this message. What great stuff. That's what we do here. We save lives. Because I have found out this sick spirit, which I suffered from for many years, that blocked spirit, that dead spirit, that, that untreated person, we damage people. I destroyed my family, and not because I was that powerful, but this thing called alcoholism, which owns me, is... And it tore up my entire family and they suffered. I became their bedevilment. They suffered from my illness. But the awakened spirit goes back into that family and things change. You ever do a 12-step call? You walk into the house, you 12-step a guy, well, I've done it many times, and the wife is doing two things. Take him and get him out of here. 
And when you walk in the house, it looks dirty, it's dingy, it's depressed looking. It looks like a drunk. The house looks like a drunk. The other thing she'll tell us is, is he coming home with fear? The kids are in the other room. The dog don't even want to know him. You work with that drunk, and they wake up, and you go back in that house three months later, six months later. It's a different house. It looks different. I've experienced this. The, the, the people in the house are different. It's different. It's woken up. Because that's what an awakened spirit does. It touches the lives of others. And it isn't because I or us are that powerful, but God is. That's what he does. We save lives. Look around this room. You guys look indescribably wonderful this morning. What a good deal. What a good deal. My home group is the Free Spirit Group, located in Brooklyn, New York, where the only requirement for membership there is a pinky ring, sunglasses, and gold jewelry. <laughs> We uh, got guys in my home group uh, who think The Godfather was an educational movie. <coughs> we, by the way, we also changed how it works into how you doing. <laughs> I, I, a quick story about the type. I heard God has a sense of humor, the type of people God put in my life. <clears throat> I was a new kid on the block and I walked into my group and they were planning these one of these AA outings and they decided to go fishing. Five guys from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. We're going to go fishing. Never been fishing before, but they were going to go fishing. So, I mean, if they got water on their shoes and they're going, oh, you get my shoes wet. But how do, how do five guys from Brooklyn get dressed to go fishing? Like I am this morning. <laughs> These were guys, if you yelled out, land ho, they would say, don't talk about my mother. Um, but uh, we were out on the boat and, you know, would set sail, we're like, look like headed for Gilligan's Island. And my friend Sally Boy, that's a Brooklyn name, uh, threw the reel in the water and he's waiting for something. And an hour goes by, two hours goes by, and he finally grabs. And he's pulling on this reel, and he's pulling on the reel, and it's getting heavier and heavier. And we're thinking maybe it's someone from the neighborhood we thought was on a long vacation. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Anyway, he pulls this fish on board, and it's flipping and flapping on a deck from side to side. So that's throwing punches at it and kicks at it. <clears throat> I'm starting to cry because of the poor fish, and it's throwing me overboard. And uh, finally, my friend Sally Boy grabs his fish in a bear hug and goes to stick his head on the water. I said, Sally, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to drown them. <laughs> and with all of that, I'm here recovered, man. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> uh, but that's, that's my home group. Um, <clears throat> I suffer from back pain, and the guy told me, you know, back pain is, I read somewhere, he says, Pete, it's from this, this deep inner rage. I says, yeah, I've been a home group member over here for 15 years. You would have back pain, too. Um, it has been the training ground for me, trust me. Um, but it is my home. And uh, I just want to put... Um, a plug and some gratitude for uh, what's going on where I currently live for the last eight years in Staten Island because there are mm, my friend Tom is here um, what a gift in my life he is there are just so many wonderful things happening in Staten Island these clusters of enthusiasm when I first got there there was one group doing this work and a lot of untreated stuff happening and what a privilege it is to be a part of what's going on in Staten Island. It's like this weekend. I mean, we have people showing up an hour before a meeting and hanging out an hour afterwards. And you want to see the power of God? I see it in Staten Island meetings because an hour after a meeting's done, you got a drunk in a corner working with another drunk, taking time out of their schedule because they know this person needs help. And I'm right in the middle of it. What a gift. What a gift I'm a part of. I was dying in a hallway 15 years ago and I've been moved here and found some wonderful people in Staten Island. I just, I, I, there's some nights, I know this sounds kind of corny, but there's nights I'm, I'm, I'm in bed and I just hold onto my pillow real tight because I'm just so grateful I'm sleeping in a bed with clean sheets next to a woman I love and I'm a member of this sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. What a treat. Um, to tell you in a general way what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now, what I'm trying to be like today, a day at a time as a result of living in all three sides of this triangle and working very, very, um, um, with a lot of enthusiasm uh, with uh, our disciplines in 10 and 11. 
I work very, very hard with that stuff because the benefits have been incredible. I need a whole lot of booze to get through life. I need a whole lot of God right now to live and to be a vital member of this place. My first drink came when I was about 14 years old. I grew up in Brooklyn. And I remember my first drunk like it happened last week. It was that clear to me because it was life-changing for me. My life has never been the same since my first drunk. <clears throat> it was a Saturday night uh, just off the corner across the street from a church. Actually, it was a bunch of storefronts made into this makeshift church. And they were raising money and there was a feast happening. Excuse me. And I remember what I was experiencing then as I opened this talk with. I was driven by fear. You know, I was the type of guy that would shake in my shoes. You know when you're so nervous you can feel your, your forehead getting like sweaty and, and you can hear your voice as you're talking and you just got that vibrating going on? I was vibrating like that and I, I was just so insecure. And I watched my friends drink col, a quart of Colt 45. They were passing around the court. And they were, they were joyous, happy and free drinking beer. They were in the moment. You know, they were roughhouse and talking to the girls and the music was in the background. And my friends were just off the corner. I was further down the block, maybe 20 feet from them. And I wanted so desperately to get in there and mix it up with them. I wanted. But there was this judge and this victim inside of me. The judge would balk at me at what a loser I was. And the other part of me would say, you know, the judge is right. You don't belong anywhere. I tried hanging out with the jocks. I couldn't do it. I tried hanging out with the tough guys. I got beat up. I tried hanging out with the intellects. It was a disaster area. I couldn't even pull that one off. Um, <laughs> Wherever I went, there I was. And this Saturday night was certainly no different. They were drinking that, and what came to me was how many times my dad had given me, given me very, very clear warnings, stern warnings about hanging out with those bums on the corner. I don't ever want to catch you drinking with those guys, and don't bring any of those girls around this house. Now, up until the time I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and specifically made a nine-step approach with my dad, back then, when he would look at me, I would shake in my shoes. He was a tough guy from South Brooklyn, a street guy. Full of love, I didn't know until I got here, but a different character than me. And so when he would look at me, I would shake, and when he gave me these warnings, I took them until the Saturday night rolled around. There were many things going on in my family at the time. I had a mom who suffered from this thing called alcoholism, and she experienced it more about alcoholism and talks about that incomprehensible demoralization. She experienced that over and over and over again. And I grew up with that stuff, wondering, when is my, when is my mom going to get better? When is she going to sober up? I didn't know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous. I just knew my mom was drinking herself to death. And she finally succeeded in doing that. When she died, I was completely leveled by it. I was destroyed by it. It took many years in here and not getting outside help to walk through that. And I've had some experiences with meditations, put that to rest. But back then, when she took her life, I was completely leveled. My design for living was removed right out of my lap. I had this guy called Dad who was cunning, baffling, powerful, 20 feet tall, and my mom was the only one I can go to. And she gave me great instructions for life, but she was just so sick. And she finally succeeded in what she tried to do for so long, and I was leveled, empty. And I think we all get separated from this power somewhere. I don't believe God puts us here and then separates us, leaves us on our own. That would be a cruel God. I don't have a cruel God, and I doubt you do also. I have a loving and caring God. But somewhere I got separated. My mom would teach me how to pray. I'm a Catholic. She would take me to church. She would do all these wonderful things and try to bring me upright. Tell me how much God loves me. And then she dies. I see her suffer and die. And I think that's where maybe I was separated from this power. Separated. And thank the good Lord I come in here and I was, had this new relationship integrated once again with this power. But back then it wasn't like that. And I think that's where I was separated from God. When I... Watch my friends drink. I, I wanted desperately to get in there, put my hand in there, grab the cord, and see what they were experiencing. It had to be better than what I was. Well, I remember the cord went around the first, second, third, fourth time, and I don't know why, but something came over me to put my hand in there and grab the cord, and I took a few pops. It hit, hit my stomach, and nothing happened. And on that, I took a little bit more, and I took some more, and I took a little bit more, and something happened to me that I never experienced in my entire life. Doctor's opinion says the sense of ease and comfort that comes by taking just a few drinks, drinks I see others taking with impunity. They weren't suffering. They, on the I judge, you know, your insides by the outside. They seemed to be okay in doing what they were doing. Their life seemed to, seemed to be okay. They were the older guys. They were like 16 and like rebels without a clue, but they were like my heroes. So I took a little bit more, and I took a little bit more, and I took a little bit more, and I got more fired up, I got more fired up, and suddenly I was awake to the present moment. Because I wasn't thinking about my dad, I wasn't thinking about my mom. She, she died January 23rd, and this was spring-summertime. It was about six months later, and that pain was suddenly removed. 
The fear of my dad driving me up and catching me drinking on the corner, removed. The fear of the cops, removed. Everything. The voices up here, the vibrating, everything went away. Alcohol was my solution. And I will tell you this, alcohol helped me deal with my alcoholism for many, many years. It was a panacea for my ills, man. It was it. I drink, I feel better, I'll take more. I wasn't thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't even know what an alcoholic was. I watched my mom die from this. But who knew what an alcoholic was? I mean, maybe if you told me, I would think of some guy in the Bowery, you know. I mean, my dad used to drive us through Manhattan and drive through the Bowery and say, that's what happened if you don't go to school. He would point, point at the bums. That's what happened if you don't do this. That's what happens if you do drugs. Who knew what an alcoholic was? Certainly not me. And I had no idea what alcoholism is. I found out the hard way, like all of us, by drinking. See, lots of people, there's a lot of hard drinkers in Alcoholics Anonymous who can tell you don't drink and go to meetings. They don't know they're killing people with statements like that because they're not, they're the, they're the hard drinker or the moderate drinker. I'm the guy on page 21, the real alcoholic. You know, I didn't know what a real alcoholic was back then. And I suffer from three things, and I don't want to preach to the choir here, but I'll do it anyway. I suffer from, I suffer from this mental obsession. I would get in terrible trouble on a Monday, and Tuesday my mind would tell me Monday wasn't that bad. It would convince me to drink again. I would bite a lie every time, and at the end the truth almost kill me. It would pretty up a junkyard to get me back, and it would figure out a way to get me back to a drink. Once I bought the lie and put liquor in my body, I suffered from this thing our doctor's opinion talks about so much better than I can, this phenomenon of craving. That whenever I drank alcohol, the craving was intensified, was never satisfied more, and I kept drinking. That was my drink. You want to see instant sobriety for me? Yell out last call. I sober up in a heartbeat because it was panic again. Where am I going to continue this drunk? You can go home. I can't. The other thing was this, this spiritual malady they talk about in our book. And I referred to that earlier. I think that's where I was separated, where I got blocked from this power. And those three things qualify me to be in here. Getting arrested, getting, getting beat up, getting car crashes may make me come to Alcoholics Anonymous that doesn't necessarily qualify me for an alcohol, to be an alcoholic. I'm grateful my sponsors, my teachers have been real alcoholics because if they were non-alcoholics, maybe hard drinkers, they would have said, you know what, don't drink and go to meetings and I kept getting drunk. Step one tells me I'm going to drink but the real alcoholic offered me a solution. Many times the hard drinkers in AA, in AA, they meant it from their heart. They were not trying to hurt me, but they would say, you want sobriety, go make coffee. There's a lot of uh, sobriety in a coffee pot. I'm still looking. You know, uh, join the sober softball team. How is that going to keep me sober? How is that going to give me an experience? It fell short. But my, my sponsors have been real alcoholics. They told me I was suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience would conquer. I don't tell people when they come into Alcoholics Anonymous ever, I wish you a slow recovery, because I've heard that in Alcoholics Anonymous. How dare I wish a drunk walk in here dying, I wish you a slow recovery. How arrogant have I become to wish a drunk a slow recovery? When did I become God? But I hear that in Alcoholics Anonymous. A slow recovery? Isn't God in charge of the recovery, not me? My job is just pass the message on and let God determine how fast they're going to get this. But I hear that, I wish you a slow recovery. But great people, when I went to treatment in Minnesota, and the people I met in Brooklyn that gave me a different message. Very, very grateful for them. I got drunk that night and there were no consequences. I've heard many of them, people share some horrific uh, consequences on the first drunk. Terrible things happened on the first drunk. Nothing like that happened to me. I went home after getting a really good load on. I, I went to bed. I got up the next morning. My teeth were still in my mouth. No black eyes. I hadn't soiled my clothes. Nothing bad. I remembered everything when I woke up the next morning. Bill says three great words in his story. I had arrived. When I was drinking cold 45 beer on the corner of 75th Street and 20th Avenue in Brooklyn, and I got to that place out there that's indescribably wonderful, I arrived. I had my passage into manhood. Everything was good. And so when I got up Sunday morning to go down to the park to play basketball with the older guys, I walked into that park, and my shoulders were just a little bit wider. My chest was a little bit bigger because I got my stripes the night before. And I knew I found a solution. I can deal with this week because next Saturday I'm going to get fired up and capture that elusive feeling once more. I'm going to get to that place. I found a solution. I felt part of, finally. Something made me awake to the present moment. It was called Cold 45 Beer. I didn't know. I just stepped onto a road paved right to hell called alcoholism. It was going to turn into this flight, as Bill says, like a boomerang, and at the end cut me to ribbons. Knew nothing about it. Just give me more, man, because I want to feel better. 
I started drinking on Saturday nights, and I got, you know, to brainstorm, why wait till Saturday when I can get this going on Friday? So I started drinking on a Friday, and it became Friday, and then Saturday, and Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And little by slowly, I was drinking during the week. My hero went from Mickey Mantle to Keith Richards. And I wanted to be like Keith. And uh, so I was a musician. I was a wannabe basketball player. Growing up in Brooklyn, I thought I was Michael Corleone for a while. Um, but, you know, I was trying to do all these things, but I wanted to drink. And liquor, as Bill says, assumed more serious proportions in my life. And there were many, many unhappy scenes in my house. Little by slowly, that my, that I, the, it, the consequences that I was starting to experience my family was starting to experience also because of my drinking. I became Debbie Devilman, and they didn't do anything. You know, as I continue to drink during the week, um, my dad would tell me, I want you home by a certain time. That went out the window. Don't hang out with this crowd. That went out the window. And he would give me these, these, these lectures. I would, he, my dad would be out, you know, socializing with his friends. I have two kid brothers at home, and I wait for him to leave, and then I'd go out. Leave sober. My two kid brothers idolized me. They would dress like me, try to talk like me, try to be like me. I was their older brother. And then I would come home drunk. And very, very often I was a nasty, ugly drunk, dumping lots of earthy language in their lap about this guy who took my mom and this guy called that. I have no idea how to operate around. I'm scared to death. And they got all of it. And little by slowly, they start to become afraid of me. My alcoholism was affecting them. And they didn't do anything. And they would tell my dad, and my dad would corner me and give me these lectures about what I was doing with my life. They saw my downfall way before I did. And my biggest problem with drinking back then was their problem with my drinking. But I was affecting them, this thing called alcoholism. Now you want me to stand at a podium and say, don't drink and go to meetings and you're a winner? How arrogant. My big book tells me we were like tornado roaring through the lives of others. We leave what? Damage in the pre. Those people are home doing their thing and we tear up their lives. And I want to come into an AA meeting and say, just don't drink and go to meetings and you're a winner. What about amends? What about going back and fixing that stuff? What about being a productive member of your family and nursing them the way they nursed us? What about that? I don't hear that enough in Alcoholics Anonymous. Not where I'm from. I hear don't drink, go to meetings, don't worry about the steps, the steps will get you. <laughs> Do a step a year, the AA walls. Could you imagine if Bill did a step a year? We would not be here this morning. See, but I'm so grateful for the teachers, the first teachers I met in Minnesota when I went to treatment out there, who ruffled my feathers. They disturbed me on the question of alcoholism. They were in the life-saving business. If they became friends, great. But they put their head on a pillow no, and they gave me truth. And it disturbed me. And I went back to them for more because they knew, they would, they, they knew what they were talking about. I couldn't, I couldn't be around people who said, well, you know what, read page 449 in acceptance and call me every day. Read how it works. Work the slogans. How, you know, turn it over. I'm looking to turn a table over when they would tell me those things. I started to become a coward, which is what alcoholism turned me into, a coward. Not a tough guy. And like a coward, what I would do is when I would wake up, as Bill says, when a morning terror man is on him, it was on me, and I needed to get money to get out the door to go get fired up. And what I did like a coward was steal from people that I love. My family. It was an easy mark. You know, my brothers were going to school and they had part-time jobs. And you would figure money is safe in the house, in a dresser drawer, on a counter, wherever it is, right? It's home. But not with me in the house, because I would do, if there's 50 bucks, my thinking is 30 is half, it goes with me. They're working, they'll get more. And I was really okay with it. I start to steal from my dad. You know, he would go down for breakfast in the morning. He'd have his robe on and his pants would be draped over the dresser. And he always carried lots of cash on him. And I'd go into his pocket and take money out of it. And then meet him for breakfast. And like any loving parent would say, do you need any money on you today? I'd say, Dad, I could use a few bucks. He'd go back upstairs and give me some money. He'd tell me, have a good day. And I had that going. One morning I woke up and I really needed to get fired up and I was experiencing that, that uneasiness. Like I knew I needed to drink and I was going to start to get sick. And I couldn't steal from the house except for one place. I went to a dresser drawer and uh, I found uh, my dad's checkbook. And so I got the brainstorm. If I could forge his name, I'll go down to the bodega, the liquor store. Care. You guys have bodegas out here, by the way? No? <laughs> There are places where you sell beer and food, one of those places. Um, and I would go in there and I would, you know, forge my dad's name and, and cash it and get some money and go get fired up. And I did that for a short time because I knew nothing about something called checking statements. Uh, <clears throat> that stuff came back and uh, he came looking for me. 
And uh, he caught me over in Manhattan, the lower Manhattan, uh, right by the Brooklyn Bridge, a place called the Southbridge Towers. I was dating a girl, and we were sitting in the car. My dad drove up and jumped out of the car and screamed my name, and I knew I was in trouble. Any time that type of approach from this man, I knew I was in trouble. Uh, you know, it wasn't like Leave it to Beaver on TV where dad shows up with a shirt and tie. Um, my dad's a longshoreman, and uh, um, you listen when he spoke, and he jumped out of the car. And uh, what I did was, instead of driving away, I left the girl in the car, and I got out, and I ran away. Uh, <coughs> um, and he yelled my name, and I froze, and uh, the first thing I did was blame her. Because, you know, it was her fault and the guys in the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, thank the good Lord, he didn't buy any of it. Um, he sent me off to my first rehab. And I went away to this place in Long Island, New York, this real nice place. And what I did for 28 days was push-ups and sit-ups. I ate great, slept great. I learned words like enablers and dysfunctional family and inner child and all these fancy words. <laughs> Never took responsibility for my illness. I didn't concede to my innermost self, the first step that I was an alcoholic. That's a spiritual thing when that happens. When we get to that bitter end, that place, but we, deep down in here, no one has to point fingers at us. We concede to our innermost self. I was nowhere near that. I got caught. In fact, the first few rehabs I went to, I got caught, and it got too hot, and I had to get out of town. So rehab sounds like a good deal. You know, they'll nurse me back, they'll give me some medication, I'll be eating soon, I get a nice clean bed, watch a little TV, go to group, talk about my enablers, all that jazz, and I'm out of there, freshen up when it cools down. And that's how I would go to rehab. Of that I have and make use of what they do, because I do, it's all great. You won't, you won't experience relief here. You'll experience freedom. There's a big difference, and you'll get freer as you continue to have new and effective spiritual experiences with this great power. What great information if you're sitting here tonight rocking and rolling with a smile on your face and dying on the inside because I did it. We're actors. Get a real alcoholic. Find one. We're here. And just ask. We know where you are. You don't have to pretend. We know where you are. And the real people who are doing the deal will go to any lengths to help you recover. I got thrown out of this apartment and I went to live on the streets and I signed myself out of my sixth rehab and um, it was a disaster. I used to panhandle by the Manhattan Bridge and, and uh, you know, panhandle through the Lower East Side and do whatever I had to do to get a drink and I took up residency at the back of a hallway um, on a street called Division Street in Lower Manhattan. And I would go to any lens for the price of a drink. And I lost contact with my family. I was unemployable. I was living the part of a Bowery bum. And uh, again, I used to say, you know, if you're out there, why, why are you doing this to me? And I had one day, and we all experienced this, this moment of clarity, that lucid interval that our big book talks about, that little bit of opening where we're struck sober for that moment. Right? And I realized at that moment what I was. And I was going to die. And I had thought of my mom who had passed... Long before that, I had thought of my family who I hadn't seen for quite some time. And I had that moment. And what I did with it was look up to, to, to the skies and curse God. You did this to me. You took my mom. You took me fam my family. Look what you turned me into. And I will tell you, I hated God. I hated God. And it was difficult for me to share that in Alcoholics Anonymous my first year, how I felt about this God. You're not such a nice person. And I want no party. Look what you did to my life. What did I do to you? But see, God in His infinite mercy and infinite love did not say, you know what? Six rehabs, you cursed me, and you burned every bridge I put in front of you. Now I'm going to lock doors on you. What my loving God did is what we do with children when they hurt. Because if I think I'm bigger than a child in God's eyes, I'm mistaken. I'm one of His children like you are. And that's how He sees me. And what do we do with children when they're hurt? We hold them, we put them on our lap, and we let them know it's going to be okay. We comfort them and we teach them. And that's what my God did for me. What a great deal. And he put me, really just put me in my seventh rehab. And that came by really divine intervention and working through my dad. I got thrown out of this apartment. I'm running around the streets and I'm praying to die, living in the back of a hallway, going to any lens, looking the part of a bum. And um, I wound up in a hallway. And I had, again, this moment. God again served me truth. Once again, and this was the flimsy reed that proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. Because I'm here today, this morning, recovered. Something happened. Way beyond me. Way beyond what I could see. Way beyond my power. 
But in this, this moment of clarity, I didn't curse God anymore. I begged from the bottom of my heart, God, if you're out there, please take this from me. Because I knew I was going to get drunk and die. The next drink was going to kill me. And I wasn't thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous. I wasn't thinking about the big book. I wasn't even thinking about anything to do with this place. I just don't want to die like this in this hallway. And God put my dad back in my life because I was running through the streets one day. Here's a man who used to take pictures of me and go into the projects in downtown Brooklyn and pay off the winos and the junkies. Say, where's my son? I know he's around here. This is what he would do for me. And the only person I can think of in this moment of clarity when I begged to God to get help was to think of, I've got to find my dad. And I remember going to the phone and trying to call him a few times, collect. And uh, I would, I would have things crying, Jack, I couldn't even make the phone call. My dad was in gambling in Atlantic City, and he got a feeling in his gut that I was in trouble. And he came looking for me. And we met in Brooklyn. And... Um, he drove up in his car and he saw me and this time he didn't scream my name but this I remember he just called my name and he walked across the street and I had pants that were soiled and blood stained and, and construction boots with holes in them and I hadn't taken a shower in I don't know how long and um, I said dad I'm okay you know, don't worry about it and, uh, <laughs> and I remember collapsing in his arms and um, he had every right to knock me from one end of the avenue to the other and I remember this because my dad's not this type of guy, but him holding on to me. And um, he was patting me on the back and telling me, telling me that I was going to be okay. And that uh, he wasn't going to lose his son. And um, thank the good Lord, I went off to my seventh and God willing last rehab. And uh, I wound up in this rehab, and um, after about 10 days, the insidious insanity of the first drink was galloping back. Bill talks about it in the Mayflower Hotel, separated from alcohol, and things weren't going his way, and the illness was galloping back. Alcohol don't care how long I'm sober. And uh, after about 10 days, I was thinking, if I can get myself out of here, maybe I can do it different. And I got real scared. P.S. They sent me out to Minnesota, the God country where people out there were doing the deal. They were doing the deal, man. And I would go to a meeting. I was telling my friend Cookie, this place called The Three Legacies was this big. And I was walking counting days, and I was scared to death, and everyone was dressed at the door. And I was scared to death of it, but they stood with dignity. These are drunks standing there with, with dressed. It was different life, different th- I never saw this before. I'm so used to living in the back of hallways and I walk into this place and every speaker would get up to the podium with a big book and share their experience from it. Whatever they wanted, whatever they had I wanted. God I wanted. And I got a sponsor. And after about 10 months I was brought home and I went to my home group, the Free Spirit Group. And I, my first appointed teacher showed up in my life and um, we went to the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had an experience. I had many of them transforming over the years, my family's been reassembled because of the power that I found in Alcoholics Anonymous. My dad, I sat with my dad in my ninth step approach, and one of the things was he experienced this thing with my mom and had to relive it again with me. How do I sit down with this man and make amends? How do I do this? Father, please give me words to sit with this man. I want so desperately to make this right. And he did. And I started my amends, and my dad stopped me. He says, all I ever wanted was my son back. And he was happy. Our roots grasp new soil. My family's roots grasp new soil because of what has been given to me in here. And I hope to always give it back with the same love and gratitude. I went through this work and I had experience to start working with people. And about 18 months ago, I started to, what my current sponsor Mark tells me is, I started to flatline. I was meditating, I'm working, I'm doing inventory, I'm doing all this stuff, and I can't get around the wall, I can't get over the wall, I can't go under the wall, nothing. A little re-emergence of ego. A lot of things were going on, and I started to go through this work again. And I got squeezed once again, got the ego smashed once again, and it's uncomfortable going through that archway. We're building an archway where we're going to walk through a free man at last. How free do you want to get? There was a squeezing going on for me. It wasn't comfortable looking at different manifestations of self. I like to think I'm the best husband in the world. I like to think I'm a good son to my, and a good co-worker, and a good friend, and I saw where I was falling short. And then the judge had a field day with it, said, see, you're a loser. It was uncomfortable. Inventory is not supposed to be comfortable. We're supposed to get a little squeeze going through. It's doing its job. 
You get a sponge and you clean, you know, your counter, it gets a little dirty. What do you do? You squeeze out, make room for more. This whole thing of spiritual awakening is by subtraction, not addition. Many times you see new people, I feel empty, I feel empty. They go out and they do stuff like I did. We go out and reach and get stuff. I need the relationship, I need the job, the car, etc. It's not what we need. What we need is to completely empty out. Be rid of everything. The carpenter said, he referred to something about, um, um, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. I didn't know what that meant until I did some research on it. It was about standing before my creator with no attachments. Challenge every belief system I had, had them removed. Stand before my God with absolutely nothing. Like I did in that hallway when I made a sincere plea to God. Stand before my creator with absolutely nothing. And at that point I experienced truth and I'm integrated with this power and I am free. That's how I find truth. I want to get to truth. I want to get to truth. And we do all this thing. We reach out there. We do all these things. And all we have to do is be rid of everything. We'll stand in truth. That's God. And it's freeing. And it's bliss. It's great. I've experienced that in here, coming from a hallway. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to be here this morning, based on my track record. God had some other plans. The committee had some other plans, too. (laughs) I had an experience in meditation, uh, and I'll share this. I've had many. Big Book talks about in the spiritual appendix, um, the spiritual experience, the spiritual awakening, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, the educational variety. But my experience has been this. When God shows up, God shows up, and it's profound, it's mood-altering, you know it, you can experience it, and the best thing to do is be silent about it, because when it comes to talking about God, silence, as you know, makes more sense. We can't convey the experience, but you know it's real. And you could be in a grocery store, you could be driving in your car, you could be working with someone, you could be in a meditation, and boom, you know you've been rocketed, you could feel it. What a good deal. I've had some of those experiences in meditation. And one of the great things is, you know, you pray, we pray to this God, we pray to this God, and there's a little part of me that would say, does he really know me? What a great freedom when I found out that I was convinced that God knew me, Pete Marinelli, that I was truly one of his children, because it came out of a meditation where he heard me begging to him. When I was a little kid, my mom had this episode nervous breakdown, whatever it was. I was three years old in South Brooklyn. And I stood about 20 feet from her and watched her collapse on the street. And people around her, and the ambulance came, and the policemen, and there was just this crowd. And I was literally frozen in fear as a little three-year-old boy watching my mom collapse. And I remember her looking at me with this, this blank look. And we lived up above a luncheonette, and the gentleman came out, and he covered my eyes. And the next time I saw my mom was in a hospital, one of those gurneys, in hysterics. It was a bad scene, and my grandparents were around, and my father was in there. It was just awful for a little kid to see on top of it. I had many memories of her like that, but this one stood with me for years. There was a part of me that always says, Pete, you need to go down to that spot in South Brooklyn for some reason. I don't know what. You need to go back there and revisit. What I would do is always listen to my mind and my sponsor that showed me I am not my mind. You want to find God, lose your mind. Get out of your mind. You hear new come and say, I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. Like, things are going crazy. No, 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 no. You're too much in your mind. If you lose your mind, you'll be fine. <laughs> you know? And I would listen to my mind. I was attached. All belief systems. Don't go down. Leave the past there. All belief systems. Belief system will kill you. And they were doing that to me. They were blocking me from getting free, from being rocketed again. I do this meditation. I was with my friend Mickey last night. We did this prayer group in the back and something similar like that I started with. And I'm doing this meditation. I'm working with something. I'm a Catholic working with something out of my religion, a gift to me. And I'm working in this meditation, no expectations, just I go meditate and sit and be with my God. And what appeared to me uh, was this statue, and I couldn't make out what type of statue it was, but it was kind of broken down and rusted and, and really couldn't see it. And I came out of a meditation, I didn't, didn't think much of it. And I went back into meditation again the next day, and the same thing happened, it was a little bit clearer. Again, I didn't put any pieces of the puzzle together, and the third day that statue became lifelike. And this saint stood there, very much lifelike with a baby in her arms and she handed me the baby and it happened to be me. I wasn't sure what to do. But I remember this, telling my sponsor about this experience. He says, Mark, I don't know, maybe I'm losing my mind, you know, something's up, I'm I'm delusional. But I smell flowers during this experience. He says, are they roses? I says, 
yeah, I guess. There's a definite bouquet when I'm, I can, can feel it. I didn't know there was a significance with this for me. And it was very profound. He says, do not talk this experience away. You need to connect the dots. And so I sat in meditation, and now I was convinced that I had to go back to that spot in South Brooklyn. I told Mark, and he had come back to Texas, and Joe Hawk was in town in Staten Island. He says, go talk to Joe. Joe will know exactly what you're trying to do. And I saw Joe on a Thursday. He says, well, go Saturday. He says, we can't wait. And I went back out of this meditation to revisit this spot. And as we drove up, Joe's telling me about some of his ninth step experiences and asked me, do you need to tell your mom anything? And um, after talking to him, I realized I did. And right before we got out of the car, he held my hands and he made a prayer. And he says, God is with you. Now you go take care of your business. He waited in the car and I got out of the car and I'm walking around and there was an energy I could feel it. If you've had an experience like this, you know what I'm talking about. It wasn't six inches to the left, it wasn't six inches to the right, but I stood exactly where I stood as a three-year-old boy. I, I could feel it, and there I was. And I remember, I was looking at me, really, as a three-year-old kid, and you know, getting down on my knee and telling him that he didn't do anything wrong, that he's going to be okay. And I made a prayer to this little kid. And I walked across about 20 feet away where my mom was having this episode. And I remember how punching this brown brick wall, and the wall was still brown. And I put my hand on that spot, and I made a prayer to my God to please take care of my mom. And I made a prayer, and I came back, and uh, I tried to put closure on this. And um, I got, as I was walking back into my car, it was as, as if something stopped me. I, I can't explain this. But something, there was something between me and getting into my car. When I opened up the door, I couldn't get in. And I leaned in, and I said, Joe, I can't get in the car. I can't leave this kid. With that, Joe jumped out of the car. He says, let's do something about this. He says, what? He says, you better talk to God. He says, thanks a lot. I appreciate the information, Joe. <laughs> uh, but um, he's maybe you need to take him with you. And I made a prayer. His father, what do I do? If you know Joe Hawk, he's very intuitive. He's looking around. He's looking around. And, and um, he sees something on the sidewalk. I have two kid brothers, John and Anthony. My brother Anthony was not born yet. My brother Johnny was about maybe a year old when this stuff was happening in downtown Brooklyn. And he walked around. He saw on the sidewalk. He says, why don't you take a look at that? I said, what is it? Why don't you take a look at it? And what was written in the concrete was to Peter and Johnny with love and three little X's underneath etched out in the concrete. Anyone could have put it there. Could have meant anything. But based on my experiences in Alcoholics Anonymous and your experiences, I have to think that once again, my God allowed my mom to talk to me once again. My God showed his love to me, Pete Marinelli. If you don't have these experiences, I can promise you that they will happen in your way, how God will talk to you. It's way beyond not drinking. It's always about not drinking, but this is way beyond. This is, this is growing up spiritually, something that's been given to me. What a gift. What a gift. I feel so privileged and blessed to be a part of this sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. This is my life, and I'm really okay with it. I've never had it so good with all the little dramas I experience. I hope to always be teachable and give this message away with the same love and gratitude that's been given to me with each and every day. I stand on the firing line as God allows me and pass this on. Because when I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I walked into a room filled with the grace of God. And every one of you are the living grace of God. And I thank you.